morning. Perfect. Thanks very much. Right. Welcome back. Welcome back to the next um, exciting session of the OERU meeting. Just before we begin, I just um, one last introduction. Uh, let me hand over here to Professor Clive Mulholland. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just not taking it. Out what, do you want me to, what do you want me to do with this? <laughs> you, 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 so it's for the remote participants so they can hear you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so what would you like me to do? I'll just introduce yourself. <laughs> okay, um, some of you I've already met. My name's Clive Mulholland. I'm the principal or president of the University of the Highlands and Islands in the north of Scotland. It's taken me about three months to get here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> not, not, not quite. I only left yesterday. <laughs> So uh, it's good to see a number of old faces here, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing some really positive stuff coming out in the next day or so. Yeah. Love to you. Cheers. Thanks very much, Clive. Right, so the plan for this session is just to do a very, very brief update of where we are at, our, yeah, kind of a bit of a progress report uh, on where we're at and to you know, just actually have a look at uh, what an OERU course looks like because I'm, I'm sure that a number of participants actually haven't seen uh, what an OERU course looks like and some of the technologies that underpin uh, the model. So am I, am I screen sharing? Yeah, okay. So the OERU first year of study, we, we're looking, as you, as you well know, two exit qualifications. Uh, the Certificate of uh, Higher Education in Business, OERU, which will be conferred by the University of the Highlands and Islands. There are three core courses which uh, comprise 60 uh, UK credits. That's about 600, well, that's 600 notional learning hours. And learners will be able to uh, select a number of OERU courses that will be assessed by OERU partners. Uh, we have 94 credits available there. To, uh, to make up the 60 credit requirement uh, for uh, credit transfer. The other qualification uh, is the Certificate of General Studies. Uh, both Brenda and Andy will speak more to this tomorrow, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But basically, there's a six credit requirement uh, at uh, Thompson Rivers University. Uh, TRU has basically completed uh, the two courses that would uh, count for the uh, residency requirement. We have in, in arts 26 credits available that would be able to transfer in. There's a bunch of work that still needs to be done there. But also, of course, the business courses potentially could also be uh, considered uh, you know, as part of general studies, subject to whatever approvals are necessary uh, at, at Thompson Rivers University. Um, I must stress, and I've you know, emphasized this uh, again and again and again, our partners retain institutional decision-making autonomy over all aspects of credit transfer. The model is designed to operate within existing institutional policies. We, we do not require any of our partner institutions to do anything uh, that doesn't fit in with local policies. As I pointed out, we do have a, a detailed set of transfer guidelines, and I strongly recommend that the people that work with credit transfer at your institution actually read those guidelines. Uh, because you'll see that the model operates within existing institutional policy. The other piece of work which we uh, completed this year was actually setting up the credit transfer agreement. So this is the contract that would be signed between the assessing institution and the conferring institution. And what we've done, we've worked collaboratively with the partners that are actively engaged with the OERU first year of study, either by offering assessment services and or receiving transcript credit uh, to review these, uh, th this contract. Uh, the registrars of all these institutions have given the okay to this credit trans uh, to this contract. Uh, it is available on the website. It also covers all those aspects that are important for protecting the learners. You know, it's the kind of thing that uh, if a course is discontinued, uh, learners need to have notification that the course is no longer going to be offered or received. So it covers all those aspects. So that document is available. It's also openly licensed. Uh, we have, uh, well, we, we have formed a partnership. Uh, the OERU has uh, formed a partnership with EduBits. 
Now, EduBits is a new micro-credentialing initiative that has been led out of Otago Polytechnic uh, that is able to uh, award transcript credit for micro-courses within the OERU model. So all the business courses uh, that have been structured as micro-courses have been approved by the academic board of Otago Polytechnic as official courses that together when a learner completes a set of courses will be able to earn uh, micro-credentials. The interesting uh, development is our own New Zealand Minister of Tertiary Education Skills and Employment has announced a national pilot study on micro-credentialing. Um, there are three pilots that are being conducted in New Zealand. One of the pilots is this partnership between the OERU and uh, EduBits. So micro-credentials are on the table and we are moving forward with that uh, initiative. So basically how this works is take a course, for example, like Introduction to Project Management. It consists of four micro-courses, role of the project manager, initiating a project, and so forth. If a learner wants to opt in for digital certification for any one of the microcourses, they complete the assessment, they are assessed in accordance with the institutional policies around assessment, and they are awarded a, a micro-credential. If the learner completes the set of micro-credentials that are associated with that course, the uh, institution will issue transcript credit for the full course that would then be recognized towards the uh, exit qualification. So th this is a, 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 an interesting development and it will be interesting to see what the market uptake will be around micro-credentials within the OERU space. We have taken a decision consistent with the recommendation of the Council, uh, the, the council of CEOs to pursue realistic but conservative targets uh, as we build brand awareness and generate data in terms of how this model works to uh, work with a phased launch. So a phase one will we start just with one course, learning in a digital age, to make sure that all the technical pieces and everything that needs to work is in fact working, to give us a bit of breathing space if something goes wrong. Phase two of this uh, launch uh, will, we've specifically chosen courses which we think would be in high demand, okay? Uh, phase two will include principles of management, introduction to entrepreneurship, and introduction to project management. Now for phases three and beyond, that is one of the tasks of this meeting, is to start drafting a, 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 the, the launch schedule for all our other courses, taking into account you know, the things that we need to be taking into account. So that's where we're at in terms of the soft launch schedule. Now, uh, I'm, 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 this is a bit of a risk I'm taking here because I know concepts like open pedagogy are not well defined. I also know that they are contested in a number of circles, but I do think it's worthwhile for the OERU to start thinking a little, a little about the things that we can do with open that you can't do with closed. One such example is, of course, the pedagogy of discovery. The idea that you can, uh, because of the wealth of OER that is available, learners can select OER and open access resources in pursuit of their own learning interests in achieving the learning outcomes of, of a course. Um, this is what Jim Taylor is referred to as free range learning. And admittedly, this is not entirely free range learning. You'll see there's a bit of a fence there at the back. Uh, we are operating within institutional constraints, right? So, um, and we have a good example with the regional relations in Asia and the Pacific course. Learners can choose any one of the 40 plus different countries to focus on, uh, find open education resources and open access resources in pursuit of the countries of their own interest and they're assessed against the learning outcomes. The other very interesting aspect is, uh, in fact, the foundation on which the OERU is built. Our approach is we have designed our, the delivery of our courses to, um, it, this, the OERU is about learning on the internet, right? The OERU is not about learning through a single application like a learning management system. And this is a key distinguishing feature of the OERU. Uh, 
the enabling environment that you can create by learning on the internet as opposed to learning through a single application. So we can look at a couple of examples. Basically, this is the technology suite that we are using. We author our courses on a, on, on a wiki. We use the MediaWiki software engine, which is the same engine that is run by Wikipedia. The reason we use a wiki is for version control, version control, version control. So that we've got one single source of information that has appropriate semantic markup that we can start doing a bunch of things with. How the model works is you simply create an outline, a course outline of the structure in the wiki, which is a collection of wiki pages. Our OERU partners have access to uh, requesting a snapshot. You press a button, and behind the scenes, a bunch of scripts will run and automatically publish a course on a WordPress site. Note, this is all running on open source technology, right? Our partner institutions, you get free hosting. You don't have to worry about this. Uh, but of course, any institution in the world could actually use this, uh, this model. From the uh, learner's perspective, the learning environment, learners access the course materials, which are designed for independent study on the WordPress site. It's a published website. Our interaction technologies, we use best of suite open source software that is distributed on the internet rather than contained in a single application. So for example, we use the discourse engine for discussion forums. We use the Macedon engine, which is a, a, an open source alternative to Twitter, uh, and a number of other technologies. We have uh, syndication approaches, which will, if a learner applies the course tag, that will aggregate all that course information into a single course feed, okay? So the learning is distributed on the internet. And I'll show you examples in a moment. Uh, that's not what we want to look at. What's going on here? Yeah, there we go. So basically, this is just a summary of sort of the technology wheel that we use. A suite of open source technologies, right? Um, social media, Mastodon. We don't use an e-portfolio system. Our learners maintain personal course blogs, which are the, uh, the e-portfolios, right? The advantage of that is learners retain control over the content that they create, right? They don't lose access to the artifacts that they've created when the course is finished, that is locked down in the learning management system. Uh, we have our own course comment engine. Some of you may have actually tried it by posting comments uh, here. We use the hypothesis engine, which enables a learner to be able to annotate any web page on the entire internet. If they apply the course tag, that will be harvested and integrated into the course feed. Uh, we use an open source alternative to Dejo, uh, social bookmarking, you know, it's sharing uh, links. This is particularly useful in pedagogies of discovery, where learners find resources that are useful to support their learning and share it with other learners. Um, and of course, our discussion forum engine, which is the discourse engine. So what I thought I would do is actually show you a live course. And this happens to be the uh, first micro course of the learning in a digital age. So that's what the course website looks like. Maybe I should just increase the screen a bit or be brave. Is that better to see? So basically how we set this up, uh, the learning materials are structured as an, a number of individual learning pathways, right? And you'll see the learners will work through a number of individual pages, uh, you know, for this particular learning pathway. We embed the activities within the learning materials. So you get the idea, you know, move on to the next page, navigate through this, uh, you know, Another Canadian's hostile, you know, takeover bid by the Canadians here at OERU. Um, so you, you, you kind of get the idea. That's not where I want to be. Okay. So let's take a look at an example. Uh, let me go here. Activities and learning challenges. Uh, Sorry, I've just gone to the wrong page there. So this is just a list of the learning challenges that are embedded within the course materials. So uh, let's take a look at a resource bank activity, right? Let me open that up in a new tab. 
So basically what uh, this is, uh, learners are encouraged to go and find resources uh, to define what digital literacies and digital skills are, right? And then they instructed, well, if you do find a, a, a useful resource, share it, on, share it in the resource bank. And uh, so here's the resource bank. I'm not going to be logged in at the moment, uh, but when you're logged in, if you do this, uh, opt to log in, you'll get a, a bunch of features. But you'll see what happens here. Um, the resources are shared. Learners can uh, share their reflections. If you are logged in, you can vote for those resources you find particularly interesting. They can be associated with your own profile. They, if they, depending on the course tags that we use, we are able to aggregate these things for the course feed. Um, the other example, and I'm most probably going to need to be logged in, uh, let's look at an annotation activity. So um, those of you that walk in these spaces, many of you will know Mah Maha Bailey from Egypt, uh, um, American University in Cairo. She's done quite a, a bit of writing around the whole issue of digital skills in tertiary education. Um, and so the activity here is actually to annotate one of the articles she's uh, published online. And I'm not going to be logged in here now. Uh, uh, all right, so part of the problem is I, on this browser, because I'm not using my own machine, I don't actually have the extension installed. But basically what happens is you, you highlight um, any bit of text um, on the article, right? And when you're logged into Hypothesis, you can then post a comment. And if you apply the course tag, Leader 101, uh, we've got a mechanism to be able to aggregate that in, uh, or harvest that for the course feed. Learners will be able to uh, reply to annotations of other learners. Um, I'm not going to waste time now downloading that extension, but that's basically how it works. And so we can go through the different types of activities, but where this starts getting interesting is uh, if you look at the course feed here. So this is the aggregation. Um, you'll see here at the bottom, forums.oeru, that's a post that comes from the forum site, okay? So any post that in the, the discussion forums on our discourse site will come through. Here you can see uh, annotations that have come through from a number of learners. This was particularly, interest, particularly interesting. Maha is running her own undergraduate course in digital learning or, or digital literacies. And rather than uh, rewrite a whole bunch of course materials, she just pointed her learners to the OERU course materials. And some of her learners have been uh, you know, participating in the annotation activity. And so what you can do with any of these, you can click through to the actual source. Well, these are Maha's learners that are coming through here. I just want to find some other examples. Um, so course is a, 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 a mention that comes through our internal commenting system. So within the, uh, the, the published course site, learners can comment on aspects, uh, the prompts that are in the course materials. Um, Here's a, a resource that was shared on the bookmark site, right? Uh, we use a piece of technology called Semantic Scuttle there. Here's an example of a blog post, right, that has come through. So basically how this works, if I click through, right, um, that's the source blog post. So, so you get the idea? So this, this is quite powerful. And all our partners, of course, we host this infrastructure for you. Dave will tell you a bunch of other exciting things that you potentially could do uh, that would put your organization in front of the pack. So that's what our learning platform looks like and is why we've gone to, why we've taken the time and trouble to actually uh, edit and produce these materials in a wiki because this gives us the flexibility <laughs> to start doing this kind of thing. It will also give us a number of exciting opportunities in the future, which Dave, I'm sure, will talk about. So that's pretty much the, uh, the platform. And of course, um, you know, we need to acknowledge our sources um, just to show that you know, we are using all you know, openly licensed things or things that are dedicated to the public domain. 
Um, that is a brief summary of where we're at with the OERU. So I'm not going to take any questions now because we could, uh, that discussion will take place in the breakouts. But I just wanted to give a summary of you know, where we're at. We have sufficient courseware for the two exit awards. We have a platform which is not dependent on a learning management system. We are ready for showtime. And at this point, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, uh, Dave Lane. And I, Dave has already introduced himself, but I, I just want to mention we are extremely, extremely fortunate to have the president of the New Zealand Open Source Software Society working for the OER Foundation. Now, the interesting thing about the OER Foundation, as a matter of policy, none of our staff are allowed to use any proprietary software. Not that we would want to. Um, but the, re the reason we do this is it's an issue of inclusivity. Because no learner should be denied access to learning for having to purchase a proprietary software license. Or even worse, sacrifice their freedoms in software choices. So we don't dictate what technologies learners use, but we make sure that they aren't, they aren't required to sacrifice their freedoms. So let me hand over to Dave. Thank you, Wayne. Now I have to just bring up my talk here. Oops. Um, I'm just going to use an example of uh, one of our one of the open source services that we um, that we make available, which is a, a link shortener. So you're all probably so let me just uh, <coughs> oer.nz or nz um, is our link shortener. So we can provide short links that also allow us to see when people. Um, take interest in something that we've told them about and provided them with that link, we can see how many people um, click through it. But um, let me just type competently here. Attempt to anyway. Right, so the purpose of this is to maybe um, provide a little bit of the uh, background information about uh, some of the technologies that Wayne has just demonstrated. Um, and give you an idea of why we've gone down the path that we've gone down and um, perhaps most importantly what might be in it for you as inst partner institutions. Um, the first thing I want to address is the, uh, the fact that we're actually trying to crack a fairly big nut here. Um, this whole concept of uh, a, a learning on the open internet and, and not, not using the kind of conventional model of a learning management system is actually a a complex task to undertake and um, it, for that matter building a learning management system is a complex task to undertake as well and what I want to do initially is I want to um, I want to give you a little bit of insight into the, the, the kind of typical models for the way that complex so complex problems are addressed by software let me just see if this is actually gonna work why is that? I can't quite see the, the screen here. Ah. Waiting for a presenter. We may do. So is the technologist who has the technology problems? Hmm. Huh. Fascinating. No, not at the moment. Okay, well, I'll, um, you can read my notes too if you want. <laughs> I'll tell you what, what I'll do, I, I should be able to, um, well, no, don't worry, you can have a look at those if you like. Um, so the first thing I want to tell you about is this idea of um, the two kind of ways that the software industry has come up with to address really complex problems. 
There is the monolithic approach, which I refer to in this uh, analogy of the tortoise and the hare, with which I'm sure all of you are at least vaguely familiar. Uh, the monolithic model is what we refer to as the hare, and the Another one, the, op the opposite of the monolithic approach, which we call the, the loosely coupled component approach, is the tortoise in this particular picture. Um, and uh, you'll see eventually why, why I've come up with this analogy. But um, most people are familiar with the monolithic approach, whether they're aware of it or not. Um, typically, a monolithic solution to a complex software problem in a, co in a, in a complex domain, like for example, um, digital learning environments, um, is, is undertaken by often uh, venture, venture capital funded commercial entities. So basically creating uh, proprietary closed systems that try to do everything and be everything for everyone. Um, and the reason they do this is because by, by being monolithic, by trying to control all of the aspects of a particular solution, uh, they maintain the full proprietary control of that environment. Uh, it effectively allows them to eliminate variables and therefore to, to uh, reduce the risk of, of failure. Uh, it also potentially allows them all sorts of mechanisms to um, ensure that their users, people who buy into their system, have a difficult time moving elsewhere. That's referred to as being sticky in the marketing world. Um, a sticky application is one that people can't get out of once they're into it. Um, and a lot, of the, uh, the, a lot of these software products, you, you're, you may already be thinking of some, uh, you may already have some ideas about products that you already use that, are, that fall into this monolithic concept. Um, <coughs> the, some of the properties of it are that you're essentially creating a very strong relationship with one vendor. You're, um, you've effectively bought into a monoculture. So people who have an ecological background will, will know that there are certain potentially advantages, but also potentially some fairly major disadvantages to being in a monoculture. And you may find that you're, you're in a market situation with a, a number of competing monoliths that are all built around a similar model. Um, and the problem is that in a, in a monolithic software development approach in the marketplace, you typically have a winner-take-all scenario. One entity tends to prevail and the rest die off. And the problem is that if your organization has hitched itself to the wrong wagon, um, you potentially have to make an extremely expensive and very disruptive change to a different system than the one that you've built your entire, um, your entire workflow and all of the, the, the systems that, you, that, that depend on, for example, a learning management system, if that learning management system ceases to be upgradable or maintainable or you, can't, you have to move to a different one, you, you've lost a huge amount of, of organizational knowledge and effort. Um, so that's a huge risk. Um, now, I'm sorry, I, I, actually I'll go back here first. Um, the advantages of a monolithic model are they tend to be very fast to market and they tend to be a great way of breaking into an entirely new solution domain. So when you've got an entirely new problem like trying to have a digital learning system during literal digital, digital learning environment, that's uh, um, something that is often handled or the, the first products to emerge are ones that are in this model. Um, and the, the benefit is that you only have a relationship with one vendor. And they can also be fairly complete in, in the terms of what they offer. The downsides are that they tend to be very slow to adapt as the market gets more mature. They tend to um, never be quite the best of breed. They, because they try to meet every particular problem that that solution domain throws up in front of, uh, in front of them, very often there'll be some point solution someone else will have come up with that does a much better job of solving one part of that problem, but maybe doesn't have the breadth of the monolithic solution. I don't know if you can imagine some of those situations. But yeah, the whole idea of a monoculture and a, and a monopoly are um, something that probably most of us know is, is something to avoid if you can. Um, and the other thing is that you tend not to have an upgrade path. So all, all technologies tend to have a life cycle. They start off big and strong, and they, they build on top of some whatever the cool technology underpinnings is at the time that the system was built. And that particular um, technology kind of crests as a wave and then it, then it starts going downhill and something else supersedes it. 
uh, and the difficult thing is moving from the first generation to the second generation, and that is often an incredibly painful process in this when this when you're contending with this model. And the the lock-in aspect is also uh, something that gets progressively worse the more time that you spend within a particular monolithic system. The alternative to the monolithic system is the loosely, loosely coupled component approach. Um, so, whereas uh, people have characterized the monolithic approach as sort of the cathedral, top-down, one person's um, image or one person's vision for how a piece of complex software should be developed, that's the cathedral model. The bizarre model is chaotic. It um, depends on transactions between lots of different components. Um, it tends not to be something that emerges immediately in a new problem domain. It's something that tends to come along as the monolithic solutions become more mature and the problems with them become more apparent. Um, it tends to involve a whole bunch of different vendors. It's, it's essentially buying components from different people and plugging them together in some way. And that implies that you have to have uh, some mechanism for the components to talk to each other that everyone agrees on. So standards for, for communication between the components of a large software system. But they have the advantage of being much more diverse. Um, they tend to have a level playing field, so you get more competition amongst vendors, which, which uh, provides more choice and, and a faster evolution of, of the different components. And it also creates a, a much more flexible and adaptable system over time. Um, as I said before, the best of breed components are one of the big um, advantages of this. The idea that you can swap out some, a component that's perhaps not as good as another one that suddenly emerges in the marketplace. You can, you can pull it out and, and put in a new, better component with minimal disruption to the way that your system works and without you know, breaking things for everyone, you simply get an improvement. Um, you have the potential to do upgrades because there's all of the vendors involved in this process have an interest in making it easy for, to migrate between components and you get vendor diversity and in fact tend not to have any, any lock-in. Um, over time, you may also find that you'll get vendors who act as a meta solution vendor that will say, we, ha we have curated a set of components from different vendors that we know work together very well and we'll support a particular collection and we'll make sure that that's always the best of breed from each of them and we'll, it'll, we'll make it our business to ensure that, that we're always vetting new components to see if something could be swapped out for a better component, if that makes sense. So it's kind of a constantly improving system because, um, because there's all this choice within the solutions, the solution space. Um, the problems that you do run into with it, though, is, of course, that messiness that I described. You may get things like inconsistent interfaces, potentially, because different organizations are producing them. You might have um, variability that's you know, superficially visual, you know, visually different, but you also may have differences in the ways that forms behave, for example, or things along those lines. Um, and it takes longer to, you know, the marketplace has to be more mature before this is really a possibility. No, I can't see. Um, but we, we are of the mind at the OER uh, Foundation that the rabbits have had their day. Um, the monoliths are, uh, are starting to show their age and they're starting to show their limitations and almost everybody I should think among you has had experience with these monolithic systems and the impediments that they uh, represent in many cases. The market is mature enough to be looking at a component-based model. Um, and so, yeah, we like to think of ourselves as a fleet tortoise. <laughs> In fact, um, Wayne, Wayne has coined the term, most of you will have heard of the concept of slow foods. Does everyone know what that means? The, yeah, the idea that nowadays, you know, people are so focused on being fast and doing things in a, in a fast and often very wasteful and not very, you know, don't, don't take time to appreciate things like food, meals, and sitting down with friends and so on, the idea that you can have a, um, you, you can actually really specifically enjoy a meal that's done slowly so that you can, you know, um, have the satisfaction of, of en enjoying your food while also having good company and, and uh, reflecting on things rather than just um, being go, go, go all the time. Um, so we're doing something quite similar with software. Good things take time. Um, now, as you may imagine, the this 
loosely coupled component environment is actually what we refer to as the natural habitat of the open source software world. There are exceptions to this. Some of you may be familiar with Moodle, which is an open source learning management system, but it tends to, it, well, it has adopted the monolithic model. Um, what we're talking about is something altogether different from that. Um, so, so as Wayne has said previously, the, the idea of a loosely coupled um, set of tools that are part of the open internet and being able to work across the internet um, with far fewer limitations. Um, so these particular pieces of software are probably familiar to many of you, right? Um, These probably are somewhat less familiar. Those are all open source alternatives that perform very similar um, and probably equivalent in most cases act actions. Um, the question is, would you ever think of using any of those ones on the right? I mean, in many cases, you would never even have heard of them. But there's a reason that you haven't heard of them and that you have heard of the others and the people in marketing will probably start to see where I'm going with this. These ones have all of your money. <laughs> and they use that to advertise back to you. We're talking literally billions of dollars, each of them, per year. Some of them have you know, like probably five or six billion dollars being spent on advertising every year. Um, the ones on the right, however, are just communities of people writing good software. They don't market it because they, they are writing for themselves they're writing for the people that are in their community. And if anybody else finds it useful, that's great. But the bottom line is that they're writing software for it to be good and to solve their problems rather than to have something that they can then sell to other people. Um, there's quite a different dynamic. Whoops, sorry, I think there's another one up. So this free and open source software, and we always talk about it as free and open source. You hear the word free and at the, at the start of it, and you may wonder why we're talking about that. We don't mean free as in zero cost. We mean free as in um, protecting the freedom of the people who use it. So one of the fundamental things about um, free and open source software, the, the term open source is widely known. If you talk about free software, most people will immediately assume that you just mean you don't have to pay anything. But, but there's a specific um, definition for free software uh, which was developed by this fellow Richard Stallman back in 1985. And it's worth pointing out, um, the entire open movement really comes from this, this fellow's thinking and the way in which he defined the freedoms that, that uh, this free software must contain in order to be considered free software. He's created these four, um, these four qualities. Um, which he calls the essential freedoms. The reason that it starts off with number zero rather than one is because programmers think the first number should be zero. And that's how all programs are written. So he did that because he was writing this for programmers. Um, but the idea is that you can run the software for any purpose that you want if it's free software. You don't have to, you know, no one will tell you, no, you're not allowed to use it for that purpose. That's just not the way it works. You're allowed to study the code to study the way the software works. And that basically means that all the source code for the software is available. So think of it as the recipe. If you're, if you're not a programmer, you may not know what I mean by source code, but think of it as the recipe that allows you to recreate the, the dish perfectly each time. And you can change, you can alter the recipe and alter the software. You have the ability to redistribute the software that you've, you've received so you can share it with your neighbor. That's one of the core tenets of this and in fact, something that really appealed to me about working with the OAR Foundation um, is this idea that you, know, you cannot learn without sharing. And yet almost all of the commercial entities historically that aren't OER based are essentially blocking sharing. I like to tell people, you know, in kindergarten, you're really thriving. You're really doing, you're at the top of the class if you really know how to share well. And then after kindergarten, you're taught not to share. In fact, you're taught it's wrong to share in many cases. In fact, you're fired for sharing once you get into the commercial world. Um, but the idea behind this is, some would argue naive, some would argue it's overly idealistic, but I just think it feels it's, it's the right thing to do. Um, and lastly, you're allowed to improve on the software, and if you improve on it, you have every right to distribute those modifications under the same terms. So anyone else can do the same. So the idea is that the user can 
and should be the developer. So not everyone is gonna be a software developer, but everyone who uses the software might know a software developer or wanna hire a software developer and they can make the software do exactly what they want and they have every right to do so. And they have that in perpetuity based on the way that the licenses for the software are created. Um, for some of you who are familiar with OER, this may look quite familiar. Some of you will be familiar with David Wiley's five R's. You'll, they've been re, recast to uh, make more sense to educators, um, but they are based on his discussions with Richard Stallman. So the OER movement actually emerged from the open source software movement. So that's to a certain extent, I mean, I, I, I didn't really realize that there was that relationship, but David Wiley actually talks about his discussions with, with Richard Stallman. Um, so, uh, actually, hang on, I have another slide here. We have in the OER Foundation um, a immersion in openness, and in fact, we, we invite our, our um, partners to participate in that to the extent that they have interest and comfort doing so. But the idea is that um, we use free and open source software throughout the, the foundation, and we use it for all of the things that we do to help um, the, the internal processes of the OERU. Um, we also use them, as Wayne said previously, uh, for all of our um, for all of our partner-based uh, OER assembly. So the collaborative assembly of, of materials, so that's through the Wiki uh, Wiki Educator site, and and the discussions that we have around that using open open technologies, open source technologies. We also use them for for our learners and. As Wayne said, he mentioned that, that we don't want to have a situation where any learner has to compromise their freedom in order to participate in any of, of the offerings that we, that we make. And I don't know how many people have really thought carefully through the, the ramifications of, of your entire organization, for example, using Google Apps or using Microsoft three, Office 365 or something, and how your learners essentially have to accept the terms of those companies in order to be able to participate in your institution. And I don't think anyone has actually read them, literally no one, beside the person who wrote them, which is, who knows, they must have paid them a lot of money because they're boring, as boring as can be. But if you have any, if you ever read through them, just, just read, you know, a few paragraphs of it and you'll realize very quickly that you probably wouldn't have signed it if you read it. And, um, and, and if you think about your children, for example, in, uh, you know, in school, that what someone has clicked, I accept for them on their behalf. And in many cases, children have no idea that they've, what they've accepted. Most of us don't. Um, but when you, when you realize what's, what, what, what you've indemnified these companies for, uh, the fact that, for example, none of these pieces of software are even guaranteed to provide the services that they're advertised to provide, You've, you've, you know, anyway, I won't go into the details, but uh, the point is um, we try to avoid that by making sure that people are, are left to their um, own recognizance and can make their own decisions about these things. So we see these, these free software components as being like Legos that we can try out. And as I mentioned before, you can, you can try new things and you, you, you can fit in new components into place and try them out. And you can add them to your, to your mix of tools. If they work and, and people enjoy using them and they find them valuable, you keep them. If they don't work, you discard them and replace them with something else or you, you don't need to use them at all. The idea is that with free software, you have no impediments to trying new things because you don't have to go through a procurement process. You don't have to go through a review process. You just download it and try it. You don't have to worry about whether there's budget for something. You can roll it out for one person on their desktop to try it out, and you can, if it works, then you can roll it out for your entire institution, and there's no difference in cost, because it's zero. So yes, the free software actually doesn't mean free as in, as in zero cost, but it actually, that's a side effect. So this is a, a very powerful thing for, for organizations. So part of the reason that, one of the benefits, well, I'll explain that a little bit later. Okay, all right, well, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go past this. So our MVP tech platform um, is, we're looking at a digital environment for the next generation, not for this, not necessarily for this generation. Um, so what we're trying to do is be the curators of this best of breed free and open source software componentry for the, 
your potential benefit. So we're, we're putting something together that we think works for the requirements that we've specified, but we hope that by, by participating in the OERU, you'll gain experience with these tools and want them to be incorporated into your organizations as well. All right, so just, just to give you an idea of the different apps that we, that we are making use of, Wayne's already mentioned a number of these. Um, I mean, the idea behind this is to give you an idea that there are, there are tools that are available that are actually world class and will meet all of the kinds of things, the needs for the, sorry, they'll, they'll meet the kinds of needs that you're currently using proprietary tools to, to solve. So you should by all means consider them. <laughs> these, are, these are the end user type apps. These are the kind of components that we're using within our um, underlying infrastructure. So what our websites are powered by and the, the various tools that we're harvesting um, social media content from and so on. Um, they can be adopted within your organizations. And this is, this is probably the most geeky sec section. This is the kind of, this is the, uh, the boiler room type stuff. But um, for anybody who has a technical interest, this might be um, the kind of stuff that we can talk about if anyone wants to later on. Um, so I just want to uh, similarly acknowledge um, the, first off, the, uh, the OERU partner institutions and particularly the, the platinum partners because it was uh, through their um, generosity that I actually came into this role initially. Um, and I'm very grateful to uh, have, have had that opportunity. So thank you very much for that. Um, and I want to thank uh, the eCampus Ontario group uh, for hosting this along with the, uh, the Chang School of Continuing Education here at Ryerson University. And um, yeah, all of our work is, is thanks to a huge community of free and open source developers um, all around the world. This particular uh, pr presentation package, and Wayne is using it as well, is, is actually by a fellow called Hakim El Hatab, who despite his name is Swedish. Um, and he uh, has made this all available as open source software, and it's actually really remarkably cool. Um, and all of our uh, photos have credits on them throughout the slides if you want to find out who made them. <laughs> so thank you very much. And you can see this talk online at any time via that link. I also publish a blog which provides recipes for how we have set up a lot of the different tools as well as expository posts that explain how some of these things fit together. So the kind of integration that we use to get the components to talk to each other. Uh, and of course you can visit us at our website as well, the main website. Right, so thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dave. Thanks. Okay, so we're at the point of the meeting where we actually um, start working. <laughs> right, so th this first half is really, just, is really the updating a bit of background where we're at, okay. What we do now, and this is, is a tradition, we do the critical friend review and establish the priorities for this meeting. And what we do is we break out into four groups. Now, in the early days, I used, I would, you know, I used to go around and say one, two, three, four, but the trouble with this group is everybody knows everybody now. It, you know, it was kind of to randomly distribute groups, but, you know, the family is getting to know each other. So I'm not going to go through that process. I'm just going to ask you to self-organize around four groups, you know, group one, group two, group three, group four, roughly equal. Um, and your task is to, uh, is to do the following uh, four things. One, identify what the OERU has done well this year, areas where we can improve, what are the top three priorities this meeting should address? What are the top three priorities this meeting should address? And as I indicated earlier, if you do come across any issues you would like to, be ta like to have tabled at the CEO's meeting, to list them in that document. So now what each group needs to do is identify a rapporteur and somebody to keep notes on the collaborative document. There's a link to the collaborative document for your group. If you're group one, you use group one's document. The password to access it is OER for all Toronto. 
okay? And we'll do that until uh, 12.30. And then we'll have a, a, a plenary report back session. Our virtual participants have also got a virtual group. If there's anyone that is awake in other parts of the world, they can uh, contribute to the, the, the virtual group uh, document. And I also would like to um, welcome Nico. Maybe, Nico, you can just do a very quick introduction. Uh, we're very excited to have you here. Uh, thanks for, I'm Nico Koenig from Peer to Peer University. And, uh, uh, Wayne convinced me to come even though my wife is going to give birth in another week. So <laughs> so I'm really happy to be here and I'll be making a presentation later this afternoon. Cheers. Thanks, Nico. Yeah. Okay, four groups, please. Right, we can mute and stop.